Are you discouraged by the state of our world, disheartened by the corruption of our culture, disquieted by the almost suffocating darkness that permeates nearly every single aspect of our society? Have you ever read the ghastly prophecies in Revelation and thought, Good, it's about darn time. Well, then this course is for you, where we will deconstruct, dissect, and diagnose what ails our culture through the power of alliteration, reason, and the Bible. Mostly reason and the Bible. We're going to examine why and how we got here as a culture, what we can do as a church and as Christians to reshape our culture to be more receptive to the gospel before Facebook and YouTube kicks us off for being too Christian and too awesome. I'm Pastor Shane. I'll be your sensei today as we appropriate some culture. Jesus tells a story of a farmer sowing some seeds, and it's a picture of the Word of God, of the Gospel itself being broadcast, and it demonstrates to us that the condition of the soil is crucial for the seed to take root and produce a crop. Now, it's right to understand the soil as representing man's heart, but notice that Jesus describes it this way. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in a time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. See, even though he's talking about the heart, there are environmental influencers. Life's worries, riches, pleasures, persecutions, and trials, those are external realities that are molding an internal condition. We are influenced by our environment and shaped by our culture. That's partially why Christians are so afraid of it, because it is influential and we don't want it to corrupt us. But what is bad for the goose is bad for the gander, or to put it in our culture's terms, what is bad for the self-identified goose is bad for the self-identified gander, hashtag inclusive. But the point is, if the culture influences us, it can also influence others, for good or ill, toward Christianity or away from it, which means that a culture can be more or less conducive for receiving the gospel. The condition of the culture can impact the efficacy of the gospel, and therefore, if we want the word of God to take root, we need to be tending to the soil. We need to be cultural influencers. There are several key elements that I think influence our culture, such as politics, public policy, academia, and education, but the chief driver of our culture is, and always will be, art and entertainment. Movies, music, television, books, and online media exert far, far greater influence on our culture than anything else, and it's not even close. Now, Christians have gotten involved in things like politics, particularly evangelicals are associated with the right wing, and I encourage Christians to vote, and I have no problem with Christians aligning themselves with a political party that they think best supports policy that reflects their Christian values. Christians should be politically engaged and have every right to help shape public policy, to contribute to the civil discourse, and to vote their conscience as they see fit. But the notion that stuffing a ballot box and getting a desired election result is going to change the country is ludicrous. Politics is downstream from culture. The government is influenced by the culture far more than the culture is influenced by government. Here's a case study. Barack Obama, running for president for his first term, said he was against homosexual marriage, but by his second term, he was emphatically in favor of it. Hillary Clinton also flip-flopped her views. What changed? Well, the culture changed. Now, you can say that the former president was lying, maybe, but even if he was, the change in his tone is due to a change in the culture. In a mere four years, he was suddenly free to say what he really believed because the culture changed. And that sort of dramatic shift is also mirrored in public polling. The reason the culture changed was not because of public policy, and it wasn't because of education, though that might have been another contributing influencer. The main cause of the change was due to the incessant, consistent messaging in Hollywood. 
For decades, Hollywood has championed homosexuality in subtle, skillful, charming, and effective ways. It has portrayed homosexuals as heroes, as civil rights leaders, as martyrs, as winsome, personable, and moral people, and through that, they have persuasively endeared Americans to their cause. Through their stories, they have shaped our culture to accept homosexual activity as morally permissible and even as virtuous. And this has so radically reshaped our culture that even a biblical response of loving homosexuals while affirming homosexual acts as sexual sin is regarded as bigotry. Now, this is only one example, but it illustrates well the power of story and media to change hearts and minds. Hollywood shaped the culture, and that has reverberated into politics and education and even our churches. We preached against, Hollywood preached in favor, and guess who won? Politics is downstream from culture. You like Fox News? Fox News' primetime lineup averages about 4 million people. Netflix has 70 million subscribers. Which one do you think is more influential in the culture? Politics is downstream from culture. The arts are influential in a way that few other things are. And where Christians may be involved in politics, we're not involved in the arts. Now you may be screaming, but we have Christian music and we have Christian movies and we have Christian books. Okay, number one, stop screaming, I can't hear you, this is not live. And number two, yes, we do have Christian music and Christian movies and Christian books, but if you have to put a modifier on it, it's not the real thing. Just like social justice is not real justice and the WNBA is not the real NBA. hey -o. The point is, a subculture is not the culture, due largely because of the modifier sub. Christians really don't occupy the spheres of influence in our society. We are more likely to find a Christian in China than a Christian in a writer's room in Hollywood. And if Beijing happens to be listening to this, there are no Christians in China. That's just silly American propaganda. I wouldn't even bother looking for them. Total waste of your time. And now a message from our sponsors. Appropriating the Culture is brought to you by Trebuchet from Siegeworks. Have fun storming your castles with the siege weapon that puts all other catapults to shame. Exquisitely handcrafted by retired Vikings, Siegeworks is the gold standard from the Bronze Age. Visit www.siegeworks.com. Use the promo code CULTURE at checkout to get 15% off your siege weapon of choice. Trebuchet. Hard to spell, impossible to forget. Alrighty, so we've seen in scripture that the condition of the soil makes it more or less receptive to the gospel. And we've seen that external forces and the culture itself affects the soil, and that the primary driving influencer of our culture is art and entertainment. We have clear examples of that. As a result of the entertainment industry's effective messaging, our culture has grown more hostile to a Christian worldview. Hollywood has hardened the soil, and consequently, people are less receptive to the gospel. Now, rather than ignoring our mistakes and allowing the further deterioration of our soil, we should be utilizing the same tools and same means to cultivate that soil. And through this course, we're going to be looking at how to do that and examining why the church has been so reluctant and ill-equipped to meaningfully engage in the arts, starting with a history of antagonism. We are Protestants. We are protesters by history. And our particular church comes from the Reformed tradition. And while the Reformed tradition has many noble and praiseworthy attributes, its checkered history with the arts is not really one of them. In response to the excessive use of icons, figures, and statues in Catholicism that bordered on idolatry, and let's face it, occasionally slipped over that border into full-blown idolatry, Protestants became the harshest art critics by smashing those statues, burning their paintings, and destroying their icons. A strongly worded one-star review might have sufficed. But that zealous concern for idolatry from the iconoclast still in some ways lingers in the Reformed tradition. We see this, in fact, in one of our most beloved documents, the Heidelberg Catechism. Question and answer number 96. Question, what does God require in the second commandment? Answer, we are not to make an image of God in any way, nor to worship him in any other manner than he has commanded in his word. All right, makes sense. I'm with you so far. Now, number 97, question. May we then not make any image at all? No, God cannot and may not be visibly portrayed in any way. Okay, so nobody go into our prayer room. Th that is just some random first century shepherd. Now, maybe the catechism is meaning that God the Father cannot and may not be visibly portrayed in any way. But Jesus said 
Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. The Incarnation itself is a visible portrayal of God. The Heidelberg Catechism is a clarifying document. It's not an authoritative text. And in many ways, it is a product of its time, responding to what it viewed as Catholic idolatry. And there is a natural tension between artistic expression and idolatry. In the book of Numbers, God commands that Moses build a bronze snake and raises it up, and, and all who look upon it are healed of their snake bites. And that's actually a beautiful picture for us of Christ, as Jesus himself says in John, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. But we also know that later the Israelites worshipped that bronze statue as a god. So this artistic expression that was meant to point us to Jesus became idolatry. That's a danger. Even God's artistic expression through creation, which is meant to point us to him, can also become idolatry. Romans says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. So it's not entirely surprising that the reformers view the icons and statues and paintings rather skeptically, but it has produced a history of antagonism toward art. In more modern times, we've seen consternation and division over things like music and lighting. The reform throughout history have had an apprehensive relationship with artistic expression, and this unease often produces a Christian populace that is uninterested in the medium of the age, unskilled in the use of artistic tools, and ill-equipped for the challenges of an increasingly media-driven culture. And that needs to change. Join us next week as we delve deeper into this topic. Smash that like button, hit the subscribe bell, and you can follow TCC on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. You can follow me on my author page, Nathan Shane Miller, on Facebook, at Miller on Twitter, and even on Locals, at NSMiller. Well, that's our show. What'd you think, Carl Bernstein? This could be worse than Watergate. A little harsh, but we'll do better next time. And in the meantime, go appropriate some culture. Mm -hmm.